welcome everybody here in the Goldstein Gallery in Frankfurt. And welcome to Ian Shepton. You, you're in New York right now. Yeah. Where, where are you? I'm, look, there's the view. Oh, blue sky so New York. So that's looking north. Uh -huh. Oops. That's looking north toward Union Square. I'm uh, in Greenwich Village. Yeah. Okay. okay. And this is the place where you work or is it... Uh, no, this is my home. I just oh. moved here. Yeah, so I've still got like that wall. I don't know what I'm doing. I think I'm going to put some art up. <laughs> I ha I've probably only spent, um, I don't know, maybe like 10 nights here or something. Okay. Relatively but it's a privilege to have a white wall like ours and uh, whatever. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. Um, so this, uh, this event, um, oh. What happened? Nothing. Um, it's, it's a very special combination of things. Uh, we're here for the book fair, uh, which nobody uh, uh, feels here in Frankfurt because there are only a few events and most of them digitally. So, uh, yeah. and it's a shame because we have uh, Canada as guest of honor and we uh, await one year ago, we were really uh, expecting a lot of great authors like you and like lots of comic uh, artists as well. Yeah. Now nobody came. Yeah. Well, you'll have to you'll have to bring us again because yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's great work it's coming out. Uh, the decision is made that the guest of honor will be postponed to next year. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's the same. I'm doing a um, a little event with Seth, the cartoonist Seth. Yeah. On Day. So I'm feeling my I'm feeling my countrymen. I'm wearing my poppy. <laughs> this is this, this is not Canadian. This is Commonwealth poppy. Right? Commonwealth, yeah, Commonwealth. Okay, yeah. Um, and on my left side, uh, it's on your right side. I don't know. Yeah, beside me. Uh, this is Christian Metz. Uh, I introduce him. All, all, also, you know him quite well, better than me, I guess. You, you met in New York. Yeah, we met. Maybe you talk a little bit about your relation. Why do you know each other? We know each other because uh, I've been reading your first book mm -hmm. and writing about that in mm -hmm. Zucam. And that was the first uh, meeting point. And then we just met again in New York City, in your atelier, and working together with uh, the Hunger Verlag of Steffi Schellers. Mm -hmm. So we met again, and yeah, now we're here again. It's okay. great to see you. Yeah, and of course I have to introduce Lee and Chapman. You know, the, this, uh, this talk we're doing now will be recorded, and afterwards uh, be shown on Vimeo, uh, the, the video channel, so there is a little introduction will be helpful. Uh, this is Leanne Chapman. <laughs> she's, uh, she's an artist and uh, with very, very many talents, uh, like uh, writing, like uh, drawing, painting, and an artist, like editing. You also have a, 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 a publishing company, JNL Books. Is it still uh, doing things? Yes, yes, it's still doing things. In fact, um, our latest book just won the, one of the pre Darl, the photography, um, the first first photography book um, prizes. Uh, you know, Jason, J stands for Jason Fulford and L stands for Leanne. And um, so, yeah, I mean, our output is small, but we're, we're still doing some, a, a few things, yeah. And uh, you all also work as a journalist and doing uh, art director for, like the New Yorker. And, uh, and yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not art directing at the New Yorker or anything like that. But I, I, I write pieces for the Times and the Times Magazine sometimes, and also for publications in Germany like Zeit and Zeit Magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you publish a lot of re really unique books uh, with a very own style and with a very own um, method of making. So to say, sorry for my. Uh, uh, awesome. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, the latest. Uh, uh, I know. And then this is Christian Metz, and he's a, a literature scientist. Is that correct? So literary criticism. That's what I'm doing. Okay. Yeah. 
And uh, what he does, maybe you don't know that, he published uh, the first comprehensive work about tickling. Amazing. Call it tick, tickling? Is it yeah, tickling. Ticklishness. Ticklishness. Also, er hat das äh, über Kitzlichkeit und der Kitzel. Pro Kitzel kann man sagen. Ja. Im Deutschen würden wir das sagen. Ja. 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 Ich weiß es nicht. Im Deutschen würde man ticklisch nennen. Christian, will it be, has it, is it, will it be, has it been translated in English? Oh, the tickling yeah. book? No, it's not yet. It just okay. came out just a couple of months ago. That so sounds good. You must have read the Adam Phillips book on 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 tickling something and being bored. Yeah, that that's a famous book from Adam. Yeah, uh, and uh, I try just to continue this kind of okay, the tickling. <laughs> and being bored. <laughs> it, it's about the story of the history of the thing, and he he said he confessed that he, the that's only reason he write about this uh, topic is that there is no other comprehensive book. Is that true? Yeah, that's not still a, a whole book about that. Yeah, until now. Wonderful. Until now, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I guess uh, uh, when we announced this uh, this event, I wrote, and I guess I'm right, he's the first one who wrote about you as a literature scientist in Germany, about the uh, Bedeutende Objekte, what, what's the name in English? Important art. It's important art. Yeah, objective. <laughs> And now, uh, um, what happened is that last week, um, this this book, your latest book, I guess it's your latest book, I'm not sure, the latest book which is published also in the USA? Yes, yeah. here's, the, here's the United States cover. I'm so excited to see the German cover though, because I changed it. Yeah. Can I see it? Oh my God! <laughs> I'm really happy with this one. Really? Um, I am. I like how this looks. It looks sort of um, like a guest book. Time you see. A guest book that you'd sign in like some sort of crappy hotel somewhere. Yeah, the, the funny thing is, you see, this is, uh, it's, it's, you big. like that one. It's, 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 uh, it's, oh, yeah. Well, it's going to be bigger. The language is longer. So, ah, okay. That's a good <laughs> language. Yeah. And uh, we, we talk about, uh, we start talking about this book. Uh, we also have um, a guest here in the Goldstein Gallery, uh, which is a really uh, a unique place here in the Frankfurt art scene. Um, uh, we talked about that some years ago, and it's always a little bit difficult to explain what happens here because it's dealing with outsider art, but outsider art is a, it's not such a good uh, word for the things uh, which happens here. It's, it's, it's a non-formal art place, so to say. And uh, there is a, they have a, a residencies for artists who can stay here for two weeks and do some work, whatever it is. And this, the latest work uh, is uh, from, a, from a, a painter from uh, Bonn, near Cologne, and she's, she's working on the topic of uh, traveling. And that was the other reason we invited you, because you have a very certain, uh, very special way of traveling as uh, laid down in the book uh, you, you did, for example, with Niklas Mark. Uh, you walked through Manhattan and I heard you work on a new book with him, which also has, maybe you can, can, we can start shortly about that, uh, uh, your way of traveling. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, it turned into a way of painting for me. I don't know, um, Christian, if you know about this book, it's with Hanser again. Yeah. Um, where we it's it's a little bit like the walking through manhattan book where i'm painting what i see as we travel and we recreated six um was it six or five uh drives from films like the shining where there's two people in a car like the shining uh void journey to italy crash um uh annie annie hall um and the man and a woman and I painted out the window with my watercolors on, you know, in the sort of glove compartment. Wow. Um, Nicholas drove and we, we sort of did the drives that the characters in the movies did. And so the, the original places? What's that? At the original places where... Oh yeah, yeah. We went to Montana, we went to Toronto, we went to, um, we went from Rome to Naples. We went, the Annie Hall one was the shortest. It was just from where these tennis courts were down um, in the South Street Seaport up to where um, Annie Hall lived. 
uh, on the Upper East Side. So we did these drives, some of them were long, some of them were short. I guess the longest was the Rome to Naples, which was the drive that in the Rossellini movie that, or maybe it was, maybe it was from Deauville to Paris, which is, no, I think Rome from Naples is longer than Deauville to Paris. <laughs> I sound like, like crazy Euro trash right now, but. Um, it used to go on the right side and do, do some pull-ups. No, it was all while we were driving. So the, so the images are very, very on, like on the go, on plein air with whatever the translation um, would be. To, you know, to that to that French um, expression on plain air, but it was just out the passenger window, out the front window. And so they're abstracted, but you, you know, these are highways that are often, and you know, roads that are, that are, um, that stay the same while our, you know, ideas of film, our ideas of a man and a woman in the car are completely, are changing. So Nicholas and I are gonna write about that, but, but doing the art was pretty fun, yeah. So yeah, it sounds amazing. It, it, it sounds like a very attractive project to to do by yourself. <laughs> to to yeah. out which is your favorite movie and uh, then well, it had to be it had to be a man and a woman in a car in the passenger yeah. seat of the car. The Shining. It's interesting. The Shining uh, footage at the beginning of the movie when they're driving up in like a VW Bug. There is a kid in the car, and we didn't have a kid in the car. But what's interesting is Ridley Scott used that footage use some of the outtakes from that footage at the end of Blade Runner when the two characters in Blade Runner are driving and sort of saying like, I don't know how much time we'll have, whoever does. Um, so it could, it could sort of be both movies, but yeah, picking the movies was fun. There are so many examples of, a, of two people in a car, um, but we just sort of wanted to echo our situation. Yeah. So, so Niklas is in a way your, uh, your partner when it comes to Making books and uh, about travel, I guess. Travel, yeah. Or is it? Why? why what about this uh, uh, special approach to to go from A to B? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, often there's that. I mean, we we collaborate really well together. We've done a lot of work together. Often, I think it has to do with, you know, the conversations and comfort you have when you're not facing each other, but you're next to each other. Do you know what I mean? And that's a very collaborative, comfortable space. And maybe that has something to do with it because as we're walking too, we're not, you know, in profile to each other. We're, we're sort of looking at things together. And in the car, it was the same thing. We're not, I love conversations that happen, um, that happen not face to face, that happen, um, what's the word, horizontal or? Yeah, horizontal, yeah. Yeah, yeah horizontally or something. Um, and I think that, that's exactly our situation now, Jakob and my yeah, situation. Exactly. exactly. He's the driver. He's but there's a but I think there's a there's a sort of intimacy. Like if you guys were looking at each other, sometimes you you wouldn't say things you would say when you're just in each other's periphery. Yeah. And so I don't know. I think it I but think how it's would you say in this situation, don't drive so fast and don't you see the lights and <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, I've had to say that a few times. Oh my God! Did Nicholas choose the car because I got the feeling he's, he's crazy on cars. So I got oh, he loves cars. Yeah. I mean, let's see. We did we did want a convertible for the Annie Hall ones because we recreated that scene in Annie Hall where she's driving back from the tennis courts and he finds like an old tuna fish sandwich and sort of does he throw it out the window? I don't know, but the wind is sort of whipping through their hair and. But no, I mean, whatever was available for at, for the rental was sort of what we what we chose. I think we needed snow tires in Montana. Um, so yeah, we didn't get a VW bug. We didn't recreate it to that degree. Although Nicholas probably would have wanted uh, to. Uh, just any hall is uh, Manhattan from from Woody Allen. Most of my Woody Allen. Okay. Thank you. After. Sorry, what was that? We translated any hall. I said oh. it's Manhattan, but it's bullshit. It's uh, in German, der Großstadt Neurotica. Huh. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so, shall we start talking about yeah. ghost stories? Yeah. yeah. What, what, was, what was your first impression when you got this new book from Leanne as a big fan? Yeah, my first impression is that I love this book. 
because it's just kind of the result of your storytelling, like your just your special way of telling stories. So maybe you can just start introducing in the book for yourself what kind of mixture of photography or collage or text you just have chosen to just get this book started. So what's what's your idea about that, about the guest book? Sure. I mean, you're right, Christian, in that it was a continuation of how I love telling stories. I mean, sometimes I love telling them with straight words, but more than that, I love pushing the idea of story, the idea of how we look at pictures and how we read pictures, which is sort of a, you know, Warburgian idea of how we how ideas and stories are transmitted, right? And so with this book, I knew I was taking a lot of experimental risks and I didn't know, you know, if it would land or not. Um, but with this book, I really wanted to, and this is, you know, it, it was an ambitious kind of idea, but I wanted to approach the form of the ghost story and the genre of the ghost story in particular when using photography, because I think that we read photography very emotionally and factually because we trust it, which I wanted to play with because it's sort of the way we trust, you know, the sort of the way we trust someone's word. The whole idea of trust goes hand in hand with photography sometimes and in, li and in literary ghost stories and also in sort of folkloric ghost stories, there is, you start with an element of trust, right? You trust the, the physical world, you trust your narrator, you're, you trust your, you know, you trust the surroundings, you trust nature, religion, whatever. And so I really wanted to use what I loved about reading photographs um, to try to tell and try to just push the genre of ghost story along, I guess, yeah. Maybe we start with showing a little uh, piece uh, uh, and, and show uh, also our audience the first chapter because this book was published in Germany last week and uh, I'm quite sure nobody has seen it yet. Is that true? The cockney and shuttle is the slide in the And we, we try to, um, uh, to show now the, the picture of the, the first chapter. So uh, maybe we can just tell us something about the first. Yeah chapter sure sorry okay so this was a play on I, I guess this this was a play on whenever you know the phone company or con ed or the you know utilities company or a doctor or something needs you to spell your name and i always have to go shapton and then there's they start writing c h a you know chapman or something and they say s is in sam h a is in peter p is, or you know, S is in Sam, H, A, P is in Peter, T is in Tom, N is in Nancy. Yeah. And I started to think about Sam, Peter, Tom, and Nancy, at, who have been with me all my life, because I've always said Sam, Peter, Tom, and Nancy. And I thought, actually, if I sit there, close my eyes, and think about it, I do have people, I do know who these people are. And they're ghosts. They are, you know, they're, they're members of my family. They're figments of sort of people, you know, I've heard about their comp, their sort of, um, what's the word, uh, co um, not compilations, but um, comp compositions are, are, there's a C word, I forget, of people I know. And so this was, again, kind of piecing together a construct we all use, which is like the aviation alphabet, you know, alpha, foxtrot, whatever. And we all kind of make up our own personal version, like K for ketchup or, and I wanted, again, with this book to play on these um, little conventions that we have with language. Yeah, and so, this is really the first picture. So yeah. it's not reading, but it is the first picture because you have the S, H, P, A, so you have Chapman inside. So you can read many times Chapman inside this picture. So you start yeah. with reading and with just looking at the picture, watching the yeah. picture. So, and reading conventions are just like photographs. I think I think we use the same part of our brain when we look at oh a table of contents. We know what that looks like, the way that you know um, a school portrait. We know what it looks like. So there's all this stuff. And so what I did with this was I just wanted to give little descriptions of these people in my head and also pair it with the pictures I had in my head. S is in Sam. Sam's my grandfather. So I found an old picture of him from from before I was born. Um, P is in Peter. I I do think that's a Filipino man. 
think, who wears corduroys, even though people in the Philippines probably never wear corduroys. Um, so there was, there was a way that I just wanted to go, oh, this is, this is what it is in my, these are these ghosts. Okay. And again, you use the term ghosts very lightly, which I hope the epigram, the epigraph sort of does um, at the front of the book, which is there's so, I mean, the word ghost and geist and is so rich. There's so much that comes out of it, like host, like guest. Um, uh, guest and host are actually part of the same word. And so throughout the book, I use the term ghost lightly. And um if you want to show the pictures, it, it, it was, again, all of these were from um, family, my family album. Uh, that's Charlie, that's okay. Sam. So yeah. this, this is really a Sam or? Yeah, that's my Sam, that's my grandfather. That's, um, his name is actually Leandro Fulion. He's my namesake. He was a general in the um, Philippine Revolutionary War and, um, and uh, that's Peter. <laughs> He's the subject of my next book, actually. This is, this is a picture I found in my dad's photo albums from when he was a student. I have no idea who this is, but it matched my idea of Tom, this kind of friend, like this friend. Um, but that was from my dad's pictures. And, uh, your, and your father knows who he is, or it's just- I, never, I didn't ask him to tell you the truth. Uh, it's something I should probably ask him about. You should not. Might be an art college. He went to art college. It might be an art college um, uh, a fellow student or something like that. But I've never asked him, which is weird. And this, I believe, is this is from my same my father's um, photo snapshot albums. I think this is his first girlfriend, Nancy, before my mom. And the girlfriend before my mother holds such an interesting, I don't know, place in my imagination and in my sort of sense of history, sort of like she could have been my mom or, you know, like there's all these curious things floating around and, and I don't even know if I made it up or, or if it was part of it, but I, at a certain point, my parents told me that they considered the name Nancy for me. <laughs> so there's this whole thing around the word Nancy as, you know, one of my father's girlfriends before he was married and possibly someone a name that, do I look like a Nancy? I, I think it would have been interesting. Yeah, <laughs> so, kind of the, the silhouette like you have. So it could, it could have been you. Yeah, so maybe. For me, yeah. <laughs> so really. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for me, as a, as a non-specialist um, for literature, um, a ghost story is, is, I don't know what a ghost story is as a, a literature form. Maybe you can tell us both a little bit about that. Is there the same like a Geistergeschichte in Germany or? Uh, yeah, it's a ghost story in Germany. Ghost story. So, uh, but it's, it's a genre and uh, it's a... Sure it is. Yeah, maybe you talk at the end. At the end. Yeah, sure. I mean, I've been reading ghost stories all my life. I've been obsessed with ghost stories all my life. I actually, I get scared very easily. I can't watch horror movies. It's just, and I think that fear and attraction to it, I mean, was a lot, was um, a lot of what was behind this book. I mean, it's, it usually begins as a cautionary tale. I mean, um, you know, um, indigenous people's ghost stories are usually cautionary tales. Like if you, if you go out, you know, the monster will get you. It's sort of like, don't go out and get lost and starve to death in the Arctic, or, you know, or in the, you know, woods or in the wilderness. So they begin as, as cautionary tales and then they began to address I think the supernatural the unknown the spiritual the um the unexplained the qu the bigger questions rather than the bigger answers and so um I and I love the difference between folklore ghost stories which are just accounts like oh that was the that was the part of the road you know or the um you know the the fork in the road where this incident happened and sometimes you see a child, the ghost of a child there or something versus, you know, Henry James and, you know, it's, whether it's the turn of the screw or the, um, one of the, one of my favorite ones is the friends of the friends, which is sort of about like a misconnection. And so, it, yeah, it's a, it's a genre. It's a, it's a, it veers into horror too, you know, the Stephen King sort of thing, but I think monsters and ghosts are very different. They are in Germany too. So maybe we can just 
um, talk a little bit about the ghost in this gap between the pictures and your text. Because yeah. that, that, that's just a gap in between that, and that's just the space for the ghost. So maybe for one example, when you have the picture of Peter, and then it starts that Peter, and then you have just one sentence, you have just very short sentences, and the one sentence is here, he can be heard at the murmur of company in the living room. And that's so great, because then you can just hear this marmaling in the living room, yeah. and then it's starting to get just, yeah, you, you, you cannot be sure about the authenticity of this picture anymore. And if you just see the murmur, or if you can hear the murmur, and, and that's where the ghost comes inside, isn't it? Yes. Also, there is, I played on a lot of um, the conventions of ghost stories, and often ghosts appear as sounds. And often, and often there's this, oh, you know, we heard, it came up again and again, like it comes in later in my book at, at the foot of the bed, the ghost scene at the foot of the bed, the ghosts that are um, audible rather than visual. And uh, sometimes it is guests, some, and that, that happened a few times I noticed. Um, but again, that shared emotional feeling we have around a picture or a phrase or a picture in our heads um, is, what as a writer, you know, I love to play with because I can rely on the reader going to the same place instead of spelling it out explicitly. I love to to just infer and then have the reader meet me halfway. Yeah, and this kind of uh, inference between the picture and the text and the story, there, there are more than two stories you're telling in the same moment because you're telling the story in your text, in your picture and in between. And you can't yeah, read and I think, in between, and that's, that's wonderful to see. Well, I think, weirdly, the more channels we use for, the more channels we use for um, reading and communicating, the more channels are open, rather than it using up channels. I actually feel like if we read three things on a page, it kind of opens up our understanding and lets more in than, you know, closing it down. Um, I don't know, sort of like a, I don't know what the metaphor would be, but yeah. <laughs> you wanted to jump to the, to the next. No, no, I'm, 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 lis I'm listening and I'm really, uh, yeah, thrilled. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm just kind of a uh, guy who's asking, asking, asking more for one. <laughs> I, I one think part that one interesting thing for me is that, uh, um, that you use for that uh, uh, photographs and you use, uh, I guess most of the photos you use in these books are not made by yourself for a certain purpose, but let me say found footage or in the albums of your father or in some boxes on the, on the attic. Um, and this is fun, for me very interesting because uh, it's, it's a picture book about things we cannot see. And um, Sheila Haiti, for example, she wrote in, in these uh, uh, notes on your book that that is also a good reaction on this, uh, how she said it, image obsessed times we have. So is, is distrustment in, in, in photos for you uh, a, a major method to, 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 to make this ghost thing uh, evident? Is this trust, did you say, is this trust? That distrusting. Oh, distrust, yeah. It, well, it's playing on both the trust we have in photographs and the distrust and that I can show a picture of, you know, from a family album, like that one picture of my ancestor, right? Everyone has that, the way that everyone sort of knows what a staircase is, if a writer writes about a staircase or writes about a family photo. So I'm kind of, um, I'm kind of getting to it quicker by using a photo um, and knowing that everybody has associations around what family photos look like, especially now everyone has associations around what black and white photos look like. Make, I can still remember when the black when the New York Times went from black and white to color. Like that's in our lifetime. Like it's so the language of photography is so new and it's so shared, so that it it really has an alphabet of its own. I think like someone in you know someone who's ninety two in Qatar could take a picture of a latte and we'd all understand a little bit about her day or I don't know there's so there's so much sorry I'm getting off topic okay in terms of All photography right. and ghosts I I mean I always love the way that 
very traditional ghost stories are set up with a deep sense of trust. Often it's like, oh, I have this ghost story, but I'm not going to tell you. And then everyone in the room sort of goes, oh, no, 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 tell us. And that establishes the, the sort of trust in the narrator. Or this isn't my ghost story, but it, I heard it secondhand. This kind of framing, a classic framing of the ghost story is that it's more trustworthy because it's got this weird little life of its own. And there's something about photography that has that built in too. You look at a picture on Instagram of like someone's, you know, birthday party or something and you know that person's clinically depressed. It's like, what's going on here? <laughs> like it's, and we're, we're the, the more we use photography, the more we understand the intricacies of, of the, the, the proof and the lies in it. And so using photography for something to sort of convey something that is unseen, that is sort of um, invisible. Um, I don't know, it just felt natural to me. Also, again, because of the emotion. Our comprehension, I think, of, of this, what we call the supernatural, what we call the uncanny, is feels emotional to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm playing with the ideas of like what you trust instinctively yeah. and emotionally and what you don't trust. Yeah. But yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that, that, yeah absolutely. Uh, I wonder where you all this, uh, found these uh, photos uh, besides your, your daddy's uh, photo box. Yeah, well, my aunt's photo box, I found some very specific ones in stock photo. The Billy Byron, the one about the tennis yeah. player. Um, I mean, I'm kind of, you know, going, you know, behind the, behind the scenes on this, but those pictures, because um, I couldn't, I didn't have the budget to shoot. I really wanted to shoot original photography for that, the way I did in Important Artifacts and cast it and have Billy Byron played by somebody. And I did do that in a Geist, the, the 38 parties in one night thing. That was all, all original photography. But for, for, the, um, for Billy Byron, which is a ghost story about a tennis player, I had to go, I just had to enter sort of, you know, tennis player face covered. And so a lot of those pictures of the pro tennis players at the, you know, Rogers Cup and, and Indian Wells and all those places are, some of them are Djokovic, some of them are women, some of them are, some of them are, um, I think there might be a Nadal, they're all sorts of um, different tennis players, but they, because I needed to obscure their faces, I could find that in, in Alamy, in stock photography, and just sort of pay for the book rights, and so for that one, I, I and then on, also on, you know, on eBay, sort of entering, you know, youth tennis champion or 10 year old playing tennis and kind of, you know, just lining it up so it looked real enough. Um, and again, so it's, again, it's a sort of, you can't trust that story. A lot of people go look up, but I found this out. A lot of people go look up who Billy Byron was because they, because of the trust that we have in the, you did? <laughs> in the- uh, I, I, I his mother. Yeah, maybe we have, you have to explain a little bit about the story about um, yeah. Billy Byron. Sure. Yeah, I don't know, Jacob, if you want to hold it up or I can hold up my copy of the book. So I wondered why there wasn't, there weren't more ghost stories about sports figures. Um, and because that, it, I mean, it's such a superstitious realm. The idea of sports, the idea of one shot, one performance, you know, every four years, something is, there's something so crazily supernatural about sports to me. And the closest I could find was the Rocking Horse Winner by D.H. Lawrence, which was sort of about, you know, about the, the trauma that this boy and this family has um, because they're running out of money and how the, the sort of malevolent spirit in it drives the boy to um, be able to make money, but drives him to get sicker and sicker. And, um, and finally, you know, he dies. It's such a good story. It's so incredible. And it was the closest I could find to like the sports figure. So this was a little bit of my answer to a uh, rocking horse winner and also to more, sport, more sports ghost stories and addressing just the, the weird religiosity of sport, right? Um, and so I made up this character called Billy Byron who so, you know, ha has um, a traumatic childhood, develops an imaginary friend, and then this imaginary friend helps him win by driving him to collapse and exhaustion 
in the finals of a match or in the in the sort of final moments of a match um in match points and so the yeah do you know that his name is walter the the name is walter from this ghost yeah. This match. Yeah. And in german the walter is the the organizer the well oh my god you're kidding i didn't know that and Herr Walter, Walter. the organizer yeah, in German he's the... That's actually an incredible idea of a ghost who just sort of organized. <laughs> organizing the collapse. Yeah, yeah. And organizing this this sort of false victory. He wins and wins and wins, but he um, he loses and loses his, lo loses his sort of physical um, state. Um, and so that, yeah, that was one of the... I almost wanted to make the whole book that. 300 pages of Billy Byron. I mean, I still kind of want to see if I can sustain this conceit. Again, it's it's sort of, I really wanted to experiment with it and see which, you know, with this whole book and see which stories did work in this way and which stories didn't and which were more satisfying. And and so this is like a, a weird look, still a, feels to me like a, a little experiment in the form of short story, of ghost story, because not all of them are ghost stories to tell you the truth, but I don't know. Um, wait, where was I? <laughs> um, <laughs> That's Billy Byron. Um, let's see if I can pull it up. Yeah, maybe, maybe we come to, to the next example, if you don't mind. Ah. But these are the, a lot of these are the stock photos I was talking about. Yeah. You know, those are four different tennis players. This one, this one is a Chinese tennis player, I think. <laughs> a woman. Oh. But they're not Billy Byron for the purposes of the story. Yeah. That's perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, I have, a, have another example which is uh, quite fascinating for me, but uh, to be honest, I don't understand it completely. So maybe you can uh, tell us something about that. And it's um, uh, the Gymnopedis, uh, uh, how to spell, Gymnopedi, uh, he's the Greek, he can tell, Gymnos, no, it's fine, Gymnopedi. Um, I know this this uh, word is familiar for me from Eric Satie and uh, and this little uh, fascinating piano pieces and what we see then uh, are Grundrisse, was heißt denn Grundrisse? Plans. Plans, plans of houses yeah. uh, combined with uh, 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 with sentences and yes. now that you uh, really uh, deep into into mapping and uh, this plans uh, you did it in, in in formal work as well but i find it fascinating but i don't understand it maybe you can tell us something about sure. it i mean that's like that's how i feel about every henry james ghostly tale like fascinating but i don't under i mean i understand some of them but i do love stories that are fascinating but i don't quite understand them so um uh, you can also click the next one if you if you like but uh yeah so this was this was um an exercise in two things that were happening the unreliable floor plan none of these floor plans make any sense they are i sort of took the same floor plan and um copied and pasted it into a different thing so there's a window where there should be a wall or there's a you know everything's blocked off based on that very old kind of ghost story house the winchester house that this woman built to sort of um, outrun ghosts where she'd have doors and stairways open to a brick wall. And there's just these sort of, these sort of architectural um, impossibilities. And I was always fascinated with that story in that house of this, this you know, house in California. Um, that I think it was the widow of, of somebody, Winchester, who, um, who patented the gun. And she, she felt, I think she felt she was outrunning all of the people who'd been killed by her husband's gun. Like there was, it's all, it's this sort of strange regret macabre kind of story. So that was always in the back of my head. And I wondered how I could tell that visually, this, mm. this idea. At the same time, my grandmother was um, suffering from dementia and she was living at home with my parents and she was doing weird things in her room, like pushing the um pushing really heavy bureau she was tiny in her 90s she was pushing really heavy dressers in front of the door and sort of wandering around at night and putting things in front of windows and also talking about you know cousins and 
nephews and nieces and uncles who had died as though they were still alive. So her time and space was changing. And my mom was taking notes of what she was saying and what she was doing so she could try to figure out, you know, what, what, what her reality was. And so I took my mother's notes quite directly and reproduced them and then made these, because I think, you know, what she was doing was creating these different layers of the spaces that she knew in the Philippines, in Canada. And um, I wanted that, that sense very coldly, yeah. that sense of, um, and clinically, which is, you know, when you look at floor plans and architectural renderings, you, you get a very cold read in an image. And, um, and I, I wanted to sort of just to address that disconnect that, that happens when you kind of lose your marbles, but it made perfect sense to my grandmother. And so, and then the idea, the gymnopedie was, um, gymnopedie was just this idea that, that she was sort of spinning and turning and playing in this, um, physically in these two, almost one physical space and one non-physical space. And so I liked, that word is so weird and interesting. So um, I named it, I named it that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe uh, we ex have to explain, it uh, there, there are uh, just one sentence uh, standing uh, at the bottom of each plan. Yeah. The first one is buried, uh, March the 12th, at the 12th of March, 2017, barricading bedroom door from inside. So it's like a diary of what your grandmother did from uh, refusing to bath, asking where everyone is, including her deceased siblings, rearranging her things repeatedly, afraid to sleep because of fear of not waking up, and calling for Inai, mother in uh, Tagalog. It's, it's, it's a Philippine language or? Yeah, it's a dialect of um, the Filipino language, Tagalog. Okay. But yeah, I just, I found, you know, especially calling for her deceased siblings, like I just found what was happening very, uh, you know, common to every family, but also so, so very ghostly. And I loved what she was doing, um, physically in her rooms and in my, you know, in my parents' house, which she knew very well. Um, maybe she was arranging it to look more like her place back home in the Philippines. I don't know, but yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we take a big picture. Christian, time is running, so we have to push our most important questions. What's on your... What I ever wanted to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> Never dared to ask. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't know. Start. <laughs> Start. Yeah, we have we have uh, we have other examples, but maybe you can tell us uh, uh, a few words about your uh, your uh, beyond. Besides uh, the, the photos you use and the text you use, you also use your your own artwork uh, and um, drawing pictures. Um, we don't have it now here for, um, as PDF, but there is a very interesting combination uh, about a death in Venice and uh, some story of what happens in the street where Bob Dylan was shot uh, for a cover uh, 45 years ago, uh, 55 years ago, 55 years ago. Yeah. And this is a combination, I guess, of three different things. Uh, there are in-betweens. Uh, there are different layers uh, of history and own drawing and then from uh, Thomas Mann, Death in Venice. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the role, uh, your, your own, at, at which moment do you uh, use your own artwork? Yeah, yeah. At the moment where copyright would be too expensive, <laughs> mostly. <laughs> Honestly, like I couldn't have used those pictures from, De I probably couldn't have used those pictures from Death in Venice had I not or, you know, those images from Death in Venice without paying, you know, a bunch of money. Um, I love that ending scene in Death in Venice where, you know, Tadzio's in the water and he looks back. It's the death scene of the main character. I mean, the movie Death in Venice, I wanted to go with the movie Death in Venice because the movie Death in Venice um, is very loyal to the book, but it's also a ghost of the book. It's also just the second generation of the book. Um, and, uh, 
and yeah, I mean, these are the sort of, for the, these are the sort of um, watercolors of, of that moment where there's just this gesture and he turns, you know, it's a little bit of a nod to, to Warburg. It's a little bit of a nod to sort of generations of images and, and um, also a little bit of a nod to photography because, you know, if this were a flip book, you could, you know, you'd see him doing this. And I made a gif of it, in fact, but this is about the ghosts of love. I mean, it really is um, the ghosts of sort of, um, the ghosts of unrequited love in the case of Aschenbach, the ghosts of sort of, you know, overlap the story um, that I tell underneath um, the, the, I got a copy, this is all over the place, sorry. I got a copy of the shooting script of Death in Venice, and that's what I reproduced because I, again, I wanted, where the camera is, is a huge thing for me. Again, a Warburg thing, where the, why, why this and how this image is being produced is everything, right? And there was actually a scene in the book and in the film where there is a camera on the beach that's sort of used for holiday, you know, pictures and snaps, but it's both in the book, in the ending scene, and in the movie, in the ending scene, an abandoned uh, land camera. And that being there, I loved. And so I got the shooting script particularly because, A, there's not much dialogue in the movie, and B, because I wanted, I wanted that idea of, of what we're looking at in perspective. And then with the underlying story that's going along with it, it is about sort of where people stand at certain points in the relationship, where people stand, um, you know, how a love story can change based on both of the characters, but also if you're at the beginning or at the end, you know. Um, in terms of, I bring in that Bob Dylan, um, that Bob Dylan detail, A, because um, I know that place and it is actually a personal spot to me. It was in front of, um, it was in front of um, uh, the apartment where I lived with my ex-husband. I mean, I was going through a divorce while I was writing this and there's a lot of echoes of, of divorce. I mean, it's the undead, right? This person's alive. They're not what they meant to you. It's the death of love. There's, I mean, divorce is a huge ghost story in, in real life, in real time, right? And so, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of little love stories packed into this as ghost stories. Um, it's hard to, yeah, I'm sort of trying to fit, every, fit everything in every channel into my explanation of it, but it really is um, about, you know, the ghosts of love, this one, yeah. I, I tried to find this, uh, this cover because uh, it, it, so it's also a position of a camera who shoots uh, Bob Dylan with this, uh, with this girlfriend, yeah? Yes, exactly. Like, so like, that, yeah, it's like on every road that people go there, and yeah, it's kind of this pilgrimage that Dylan fans go to. It, it, it's on the front of um, Positively Street, I think. Uh, I mean, I should look at my own book, but, and, um, you know, Bob Dylan and his then girlfriend are sort of walking, you know, arm around each other down the street. And you can see my apartment building in the, to the right of the, their figures. And so ev a lot of times I would just come out to take out the garbage or to go get a coffee and there'd be these people in the road recreating that photo. And they'd either be having a friend take it or put a little like self timer on and run back and then like, yeah, exactly. And so there are all these tourists would come and do that or all these students would come and do that. It was sort of, again, ghosts, ghosts, ghost stories, you know, infused in a, in a photograph, just these reproductions, these effigies. I always loved, I wish I'd found some way of using it that um, image in Star Wars where R2-D2 holds the kind of like image of Princess Leia saying like, Obi-Wan, you're our only hope. Obi-Wan, you're only hope. Like there's again, this is just, it's such a part of our, you know, okay. I don't know, our culture. <laughs> Let's just say for the So now we, have, we know about a lot of single stories and the whole book is about something about 40 stories like that. So you have plenty of small ghost stories. You have yeah. to, always in a personal way, always in a kind of um, getting a new view and a new point of view on special things or daily things, so that the daily things get just a kind of atmosphere of ghost atmosphere. So th that's what you have in the whole book. And now, now we know from single stories, yeah. that it's perfect to, to have that and to see that. Thank you. Because there's nothing, some, yeah. another ghost. Uh, another Michael, Michael DeForge, the ghost from Toronto, is knocking on the door. Hello, Michael. 
stages short to know and then uh, uh, but talk uh, continue talking with you so wait a second so, i'm so excited to share this with he's you. vanished a huge fan of his 